According to the United Nations, there are millions of people living with albinism in Africa. It is said that one in four pregnancies could be a baby with a genetic condition if the parents carry the mutant's gene. And according to experts, this possibility is the same for each pregnancy. Now, most of those with the condition are concentrated in Tanzania in East Africa. But you also find high numbers in places like Malawi, Mozambique, Burundi, and South Africa. Despite the medical condition faced by people with the gene mutation, they also face persecution. Allow me to explain. Firstly, let me apologize because our discussions today could cause discomfort if you have sensitivity to the thought of blood and morbidity. Albinism is a medical condition, and along with it comes a lot of medical vulnerabilities. But for some superstitious reasons, those in Africa are hunted for their blood and body parts. In the last decade, the UN projects that about 800 people living with albinism have been kidnapped, trafficked, and killed. And that's those cases that we know about. Imagine all those cases, those other cases that go unreported. Women and children are especially vulnerable. This persecution is fueled by superstitious myths. They are hunted by witch doctors, wealthy and well-seeking, as well as power-hungry people for callous reasons. Because of the belief that the body parts of people with albinism has magical powers. Even after they are long dead, their corpses are not spared. More recently, a three-year-old Malarian girl was killed in her grandmother's home and bolted away, uh, the perpetrators bolted away with her severed limb. Now, if you're worried about this, your feelings, I tell you, are valid. But what more can be done to protect people living with albinism? And that's why we are having this conversation today. So thank you so much for joining our gathering. I am Kemeni Amano. Let's now meet our guest for uh, today's discussion. Young Muhamba is president of the Association of Persons with Albinism. He's joining us from Mala Lilongwe in Malawi. He will join us a little later on the conversation. But here with us is Constance Onyemechi. She's founder uh, Women and Girls with Albinism Network. She's joining us from Abuja, Nigeria. Constance, you're welcome to the square. Thank you very much. Constance, first, I want us to talk about the recent attack on the three-year-old that we reported on. Um, she was attacked in her grandmother's home, her limbs severed, and, you know, the perpetrators bolted with um, the severed limb. We, we can only guess what they use it for. But uh, as somebody who lives with albinism, how do you feel about that? Okay, thank you very much for that very pet question. It is saddening to know that um, persons with albinism are still are still facing, they still face um, attacks such as this, very archaic attacks led by superstitious beliefs and fueled by myths from way back. But then to us persons with albinism, it is not new to us because this is something we live with daily, the fear of, of being attacked like this. You know, for a child with albinism who, who, whose limb was severed, I mean, it is very, very appalling. But then such acts done because of the myths. They feel we are mystical creatures that can make you rich. So people tend to exploit us a lot because of what they cannot explain. They feel what they cannot explain is something they exploit. So it is quite sad that a little child like that has to fall victim to such a um, barbaric, because I have to call it barbaric, very barbaric act in this day and age, 2022. Mm. I mean... Very what well. is the world turning into well, where we Const have information at our fingertips? 
Well, Constance, I, I, I just want you to do something for me before we continue with our conversation. I'd have you release okay. your, your uh, cable, the cable you're holding. Just leave it so that it will be easy okay. for us to hear you. Great. Okay, now, is it better I, I, now? Absolutely. I want us to oh, talk okay. about Nigeria, which is where you're from. Um, what is the nature of attacks on people with albinism? Okay, so for Nigeria, I will say that um, one thing is for sure, people don't report such attacks. So we can't specifically say this is what is going on or this is not happening. But then I can tell you for a fact that I, I have been, I once almost was a victim of um, ritual. So there's this practice carried out in Lagos State. They call it Oro. So at one time, I was going out in the afternoon. I don't know if you know this Oro. So when a king dies, they tend to look for um, foreigners who reside in that community that they kill and bury with the king. I think seven... Hello, Constance. I think we lost Constance there. So this Constance, afternoon, I will go. Constance, hold on. Yeah, can you hear me? I, I, we okay. can hear you now. However, we lost you for a bit, so back up a little for us. You were telling us what Oro is. Yes. So in Lagos, it's more like when a king dies, they look for seven heads they use to bury the king. But this head to foreigners who live in that community. So at that, that particular day, I was on my way to church in the afternoon. But then I was very unfortunate to encounter these people. I don't know if I should call them people or spirits, but I could see them anyway. I, I ran, I ran back home. But then when I got home, they came to the gate of the compound I ran into and waited. Now, what I got to find out at the end of the day was that they believe that uh, I am a... Uh, what's it called, a deity that should be worshipped. So their intention was not to kill me, but to worship me. And now that is in the Yoruba land. I don't know what other belief uh, system works in other um, parts of Nigeria, because, you know, we have um, six geopolitical zones. So this is just for the West. But then the East, where I come from, they do not kill us. However... We face discrimination when it comes to association, when it comes to um, having a mind of your own. Do that. I, I am speaking from experience, and I've heard most persons with albinism recount their childhood experiences to me. And I must tell you that, it, that in Nigeria, the experiences of persons with albinism is not a palatable one at all mm. because we are, we are not considered human. I, I must say we're not considered human. And um, although there are changes going on right now, but it is not uh, the way we want to see it, but then it is happening. Right. But it has not entirely erased the discrimination and stigmatization we currently face in well, Nigeria. Now, and I just want to learn more example, about your, your personal... Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll delve a, a bit more into, you know, the kind of challenges and how we'll go about this. But I, I want to delve a bit more into your personal experience. Now, when um, these people wanted to worship you, um, someone would say, the well, the, it, it wasn't as serious as somebody who was um, hunted and kidnapped. But... Tell us how you felt when, you know, regular blood and flesh people thought that you were a god and they needed to worship you. I, I lost you. I lost you for some time. Can you repeat that, please? Absolutely. Now, I'm asking, how did you feel when, you know, your flesh and blood peers wanted to worship you? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> at first I, I felt... When I saw that, I was terrified. I must say, I was, I was very terrified. I mean, seeing a lot of people not clad on white. But when I heard, oh, they wanted to worship me, I felt, ah, oh, that's good. 
you know, I think it's a natural human thing to feel like, oh, yeah, I'm special. But then uh, later I got to sit and think about it and, and, and begin to tell myself that I'm not special. I, I am a human being, so I shouldn't be worshipped. So later I became, I had this, uh, I was traumatized by that thought because I envisioned myself being in a palace, for example, and then people bowing down and worshipping me, expecting me to perform some sort of miracle or answer their, their mm -hmm. heartfelt prayers. So it was a, a traumatizing thought for me later on. That's and then tough. I just didn't like it. Cool. Yeah, that's tough. Now, let's talk about discrimination. You mentioned earlier that um, uh, the biggest challenge for persons with albinism in Nigeria is discrimination and stigmatization. Now, you were sharing your own experience. To what ex extent have you experienced discrimination? What are some of the ways that people with albinism are discriminated against in Nigeria? Okay, so I will go to our... Well, I think we lost uh, Constance again, but... Um... Some people's values are formed on social media. Their thought processes are, are formed by what they get and digest on social media. So um, there was a time we had this... Um, it was during the lockdown, and a, a lady was killed in church. She went to read in church. So I, I, I came on under a comment because it... And I spoke ill about the act that was carried out, and then someone attacked me. The person didn't attack what I said, but the person attacked my person. So the person said, so people are talking, and a person without, uh, no, the, let me quote the person. So people are talking, and an albino is also talking. So the, the person didn't look at what I, 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 I said, but the person attacked me because he felt I should be inferior to him because he has melanin and I don't have. I mean, the difference between I and the dark-skinned person is melanin. So he felt I, I was supposed to feel inferior. I felt triggered because, I mean, if I can handle this, how about other persons with albinism who cannot handle such? One time I went to an orphanage home in Abuja here. And um, now this orphanage home, what they do is to rescue children from different communities, such as uh, because we still have some communities who practice some acts, such as the killing of twins, um, children whose mother died while they were being weaned. And I saw a child with albinism. I was in my 200 level then in the university. I came to Abuja to spend some time with my uncle, and I went to the orphanage room, and I saw this little five-year-old girl and I was pushed to ask, why is she here? And guess what? They said, her parents are alive. They are not dead. But she was brought here because she's a person with albinism. In the community where she was born, giving birth to a child with albinism is a taboo. So she was actually meant to be killed for that orphanage home. And I've been going to that orphanage home to see this girl. I think she's, she should be 10 or thereabout. I've been there to give her sunscreens, educate her. Yeah. And, you know, it, but it is, it is it's sad. That, that really tugs at my heart. Um, I, I want us to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, our second guest from Malawi will join the conversation. But there's really a ton more to discuss on this. We'll also get some education from our guests today as to how we can help our relatives or people who have albinism. Stay with us here. Welcome back to The Square. Today we are discussing the plight of people living with albinism. Still with us is Constance Onyemechi. She's founder of Women and Girls with Albinism Network in Buja, Nigeria. And from Lilongwe, Malawi, is Young Muhamba, who is president of the Association of Persons with Albinism in that country. 
Uh, Young, you're welcome to the program. And Constance, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Great. Young, uh, I'll, I'll come to you now. Um, we know that Malawi is one of the places where people with albinism are endangered. But describe to us how bad the situation is in your country. Well, uh, the situation is very devastating um, because uh, within a month, uh, we have had uh, over three cases of uh, attacks against persons with feminism. Uh, I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, we received a case of uh, exhumation of a grave of a person with feminism. Uh, that was here in Longwe. And uh, within a week, uh, we, we received another report of uh, an attempted abduction of a person with feminism in Palombe, and that is the southern Malawi, the southern part. And after that, uh, we heard of uh, a killing of a person with feminism. This was a young child, aged three years, and it was in Kasungu, and this is central Malawi. And just uh, a few days ago, we received a case of another attempted abduction of a person with feminism, and this one is a, a male, a, a, a very old male uh, with a family, was about to be abducted in Choro, uh, that is the uh, southern part of Malawi. Uh, in total this year, we, we have had over eight cases involving uh, atrocities against persons with feminism. And uh, this is very worrisome, uh, very heartbreaking, because persons with feminism are continuing to live in fear, uh, are continuing to be violating, to be violated of their human rights. And this is so, so, so unfortunate. That's how I can describe it in a simple term. Very well. Now, um, you work with people like yourself who live with albinism. Talk to us about you know, how you feel for your own safety uh, living in Malawi? Well, it is not easy to live in Malawi. Of course, personally, um, I haven't uh, experienced uh, any, uh, like being skeptical of uh, my security. But uh, you know, uh, if I hear of all these cases, uh, I'm not left out. I'm part of the persons with sabinism because I am a person uh, with sabinism too. So uh, my safety is not guaranteed as far as I am a person with sabinism. So the duty of fighting for the safety of persons with sabinism lies with everyone. And we as duty bearers uh, should be forefront in making sure that Persons with feminism are safe and their human rights are respected. Uh, when we look at uh, this situation, the whole of it, 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 it surely means that persons with feminism are just being attacked based on their skin color. Uh, being white and being different from the rest of their population is the proving cost rate to persons with feminism. So, uh, in general, it is not easy for each and every person with feminism in Malawi because each and every day uh, you are worried, like, uh, what is going to happen to my life? Uh, and even um, your activities are affected because the, you look at time and you look also at those people whom you are associated with. So. Persons with feminism generally live in fear and extra care to make sure that uh, their life is in safe. Uh, very well. One of the reasons a lot of people with albinism are hunted and uh, subsequently killed in most cases is because of the superstitious belief that people, you know, people with albinism have magical powers. Um, uh, Young, speak to us. Do you have magical powers? Uh, not at all. Uh, this is what we call misinformation uh, because the uh, magical powers are non existent in persons living with sabinism. Okay, we say persons with sabinism. Magical powers are absent, and the, these are all uh, superstitious and false claims. Uh, it is believed that in Malawi, uh, traditional doctors are the ones who are forefront 
spreading these bad rumors. So generally, it is our duty to make sure that uh, the communities are sensitized. More awareness is done to ensure that people have the right information. But to say the truth, persons who Sabinism do not have any sort of magical powers. And this calls for more research. Um, what I think in Malawi is that uh, we are behind in terms of uh, researching uh, about emerging issues. Um, issues such as these, uh, issues such as the uh, searching for body parts or bones with abilism. Uh It's like the, the general public uh, does, does not have uh, the necessary, the right information. So I, I really think that we need to have more research, first of all, to establish like where all these body parts, where all these bones of persons with, with abilism are, are, are going to. Uh, if we invest more on these, I think we can be in the right step to ensure that uh, killings and the abductions of persons with abilism are reduced. Well, so, I, I see that Constance has rejoined our, our discussion today. Uh, Constance, I'll come, I'll come to you now. Um, one of the things, if we uh, want to go back on how people treat um, um, the likes of you is our families and our immediate uh, environments, communities who are also um, very much, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They are, they are very much into the traditions that, you know, make up the culture of the people in those communities. So, so talk to us about the role that families can play, community members can play in protecting people with albinism? Uh, the very first step, as I have mentioned, is to ensure that the communities have the right information. I, I'll come back to you, uh, um, Young, but let, okay. let's listen to Constance first. She's, she's been on the wait for a, for a while. Hello, Constance, can you hear I'm me? sorry, I actually I didn't get the question. Well, that, I'll come back to you with that question. Young, let's hear you. Go ahead. Okay, um, I, I was saying that the very first thing to ensure that the communities take part in all this, the very first strategy is to ensure that the communities have the right information. Because as long as the communities have the wrong information, uh, then uh, being involved is almost impossible. So we believe that there is need for more sensitization, uh, need for more civic education, need for more awareness to ensure that our communities have the right information. I'll give you an example of the case of Kasungu. Uh, Kasungu uh, having three cases, because this is the third case of that particular district. And that uh, clearly means that the communities do not have more information. So it is very important that we do more awareness and we also uh, arrange for more interface meetings with the responsible uh, stakeholders, either the government and all other stakeholders. We are planning to hold the more interface meetings to see like how best uh, we can ensure that persons living with abilism are safe. So the communities, are the ones who are very close to persons with albinism. Mm. Persons with albinism have their relatives and they have their friends in the communities. So all these people, they have a role to play to ensure that, first of all, the, the information, the right information is with them. And second of all, the persons with albinism close to them are safe and secure because the uh, you, you can agree with me that leaders uh, are far from the communities. Uh, for example, me, I am far from the communities. It is the people in the communities close to persons with abilism who have the first-hand information, who are very close to them. So they have a role to play to ensure that persons with abilism are safe. Right. Because we have, we have been hearing of a case whereby a relative 
is directly involved in killing a person with feminism. For example, we have had the Masambuka case of 2018, whereby a brother was convicted. Mm -hmm. And in this Kasungu case, we also hear that uh, the, the grandmother of that uh, uh, child who has been killed has confessed that she was involved in killing the person with feminism. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the relatives and the rest of the community really have a role to play to ensure that persons with disability are safe. Rightly so. Uh, now, now, Constance, uh, talk to us about the level of education or awareness as far as uh, albinism is concerned in communities um, in Nigeria. Sorry, what's the question again? The level of what? Yeah, the level of awareness of, of the condition in communities in Nigeria. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, from my own point of view, I would say that the level of... I think we lost Constance again. At the community level is, you know, um, take, taking into cognizance the story I narrated about a little girl with albinism who was sent to an orphanage home who was rescued. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. So I think at the community level, the, the, the awareness is, is very low. I, I can even say it's not there. And I think that is where it comes down to those of us who have the privilege of being born in the um, urban areas to create awareness and sensitization, create the right information and ensure that it gets to the communities to, as to why or a dreaded condition and neither are they persons um, who have mystical powers. Mm -hmm. Because if the information is taken down to the community level, I believe, I strongly believe that um, the, the, the news we hear today um, on the attacks of persons with albinism will drastically reduce. It, there will be a total, a, a, a huge reduction of all that. Very so well. for now, the awareness to me in Nigeria, the community level is very, very low. Very well. Now, um, I, I want us to spend the last few minutes on some education on people living with albinism. Um, it is a genetic condition, but what else can you tell us about, you know, how, how harsh the condition is on you as a person? Okay, um, um, can I go okay. first? Yes, Constance, go first. Okay, so when it comes to albinism, I believe that uh, people should be aware that albinism are of two types. So we have the ocular, which affects the hair, the skin, and the eyes. And I fall under the ocular cutaneous. So now, be Constance, we are losing you a lot. Size. I have low vision. Person with albinism have the. It doesn't mean that every person with albinism have the same sight degree of sight. Some persons with albinism can see better than others. That is why we see some persons with albinism who can drive, and then we see others who cannot. But I can categorically tell you that albinism is limiting. Now, not, limit, not limiting in the sense that you cannot achieve what you want to achieve. It is limiting in the fact that it restricts our level of interaction, our level of participation. For example, if I'm in the classroom and I cannot see the board, I am restricted. So I cannot participate on an equal basis with others, except the barrier I am seeing in front of me, which has to do with my sight, is removed and it is made accessible. Same with information. I, as a person with albinism, I try as much as possible to convince my way around albinism. I have sight issues. That is why I use my assistive device, which is my glasses. I
well, to protect my son, my, my skin. Very well, Constance. Now, I just want to switch the conversation now to Young. Young, what are some of the ways that people with abnism can protect themselves um, or help themselves given some of the you know, conditions that you, you have to live with every day? Uh, okay, uh, first one is with abnism faced a lot of challenges. Um, uh, first of all, uh, like here in Malawi, um, the problem of skin cancer is also very devastating. Um, we have had over 50 deaths of persons with abnism due to skin cancer uh, since 2020 which comes to the point of the need for uh, availability of uh, sunscreen lotion. So persons with abnism should know and should utilize the sunscreen lotion as far as prevention of uh, skin cancer is concerned. And the persons with abnism should also avoid as, mu as, as much as they can uh, sunny rays. Um, it is very devastating that the uh, most of the time, uh, you find persons with abnism on uh, directly uh, exposing themselves to the sun because of uh, the situations or the type of uh, jobs they are involved in. Uh, because uh, most persons with abnism in Malawi are poor, you will find that uh, they are mostly involved in peace work. Uh, in most of those fishwork jobs, they, they are done during the day where the exposure to the sun is too much. But still, it is the obligation of each and every person with abnism to ensure that uh, they are as far as they can from uh, sun rays. The, the problem, however, uh, Young, is the fact that maybe for those in the urban areas, this will be easy to access. However, those in the rural areas would have a challenge with this for obvious reasons. And, and again, yeah. for me, that is where the government or community leaders come in. So tell us how seriously our leaders should take uh, the case of people who live with albinism, just as we have taken other conditions like malaria and HIV and AIDS. Yes, uh, there is need for more strategization like this. In Malawi, uh, I'll give you an example of Malawi. We have the National Action Plan, which was already set up, uh, and it has uh, more interventions when it comes to access to health as a challenge uh, to persons with abnism. But uh, I believe that the National Action Plan hasn't been utilized uh, effectively. Uh, for example, in the area of access to health, I believe that the government hasn't really done much, uh, for example, ensuring the availability of uh, clinics, skin cancer clinics. Mostly, uh, the clinics are done by uh, private or private organizations, uh, donors, and other stakeholders. I believe the government should really come in to ensure that those clinics are available in all the other areas where the other donors and stakeholders do not reach. For example, most of the clinics here in Malawi are centered uh, uh, here at the central region and the, in the northern region. Uh, the southern part of Malawi has been really denied access to uh, health care, especially the, the clinics themselves. Uh, also, another point is the, the sunscreen factory. We have been advocating for the availability of uh, sunscreen lotion through a local production unit. But that hasn't been easy because uh, we have been lobbying for a, uh, for a piece of land for that factory, but mm -hmm. it seems it is a challenge because of uh, various other bureaucracies which are involved uh, within the government system. So in general, if the, if the government utilizes the National Action Plan, if we all utilize the National Action Plan, ensuring that all the, uh, all the strategies in the National Action Plan are well. taken in consideration, I think we can be on the better side as far right. as access to health is concerned. Okay, let me, let me try Constance again. Now, Constance, what can community leaders uh, at, at different levels of governance do to help people living with albinism in Nigeria. 
people. I, I don't think we have Constance there. I, and so I'll come, I'll come back. Constance, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay, so if I get your question correctly, you asked what should community leaders and the government do? Yes. Okay, so to the government, I'll go to the government because I, I think I've talked a bit about the community leaders and information and awareness creation. But then I'll go to the government because um, they play a very vital role in the lives of everybody, including persons with albinism. The main, um, the main issue we face as persons with albinism as regards health, our fear is skin cancer. And it is sad that um, this year we've lost, if not more than five persons with albinism to skin cancer. Now, um, when we talk about the healthcare here in Nigeria, it is not inclusive for persons with albinism. One, not every person with albinism can afford the services of a private dermatologist at the hospital. Mm -hmm. And most persons with albinism are amongst the poorest of the poor in the society. And that is why the government needs to equip the government hospitals right. to address the issues, the needs of persons with albinism, provide a dermatologist, provide proper eye care for persons with albinism. Because cancer doesn't just, you know, come and kill you immediately. It takes, it's, it's a process. Now, if a person with albinism is able to access safe and affordable quality health care system right. in the government hospitals, mm -hmm. I think that um, skin cancer will be reduced. Very well. The I'm afraid we'll why... have to end our conversation here, Constance. Uh, but I do appreciate okay. your time with us, Constance uh, and Yang. Yang joined us from Malawi, Constance from Abuja, Nigeria. We hope that you have learned a thing or, or two. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, albinism is like any other medical condition. Many of them, it's projected, will not live up to the age of 40. There's no point in putting them through the things that uh, happen to them. My name is Kemeni Amana. I'll see you same time tomorrow here on Village Square Africa. Goodbye.